Welcome to the final part of today's lecture. In this part, I'm going to talk about how groups shape our individual um, behavior and cognition, specifically about how groups can induce conformity and compliance. And I want to start that with looking at Ash's line study, one of the famous early studies in social psychology. The study gave participants a very simple task. It asked them to look at a line called the standard here and just say which other line had the same length. So should you try to carry out that task right now, it's not particularly difficult. You would certainly all give the correct answer. However, this wasn't done in isolation since it's about group influence. Ash brought people into a lecture theater. They were sitting in lines and then they had to give the answer one by one. And unbeknown to the participants, Ash had 12, in some iterations, sometimes some other numbers, um, confederates sitting in the first row. And they all gave the answer before the participants were asked. And so imagine you are in a room, an experimenter comes up, says, well, we're interested in visual perception. I'm going to ask you about these lines. Can you all give me your answer? And then imagine if the 10 people before you all say, well, easy question, line one is the answer. What would you do? One thing you could do is you could believe that they are right. Maybe there's some optical illusion going on. Maybe your vision is a bit off. Maybe they're right. Something else you could do is to say, well, of course they're wrong. I'd say line two. Or you could say, uh, don't really think they can be right, but why stand out? So one explanation is about informational influence. If I have a source of information, which is my own eyes, but I have another source of information. What do other people think? Or there's this normative influence. Clearly, if they all say one, they expect me to say one as well. Maybe going along um, is, is the way to, to gain acceptance. So when we think about the concepts behind social influence, the first one would be about conformity. So conformity is if I really change my beliefs based on group influence, if I really think in Ash's line study, that whatever other people say is the true answer rather than the answer that, that my own eye, eyesight gives me. So then conformity. Compliance is quite different from that. It's only about changing your exterior behavior. So I publicly act in a court with what I believe the others expect. I say one, I privately still believe that definitely we're just all giving the wrong answer now. And then a third concept that they're both distinct from is the idea of obedience, just carrying out orders given by someone else. So what did we see in F's line study? Well, the data showed that 75% of participants gave the wrong answer at least once. 35% just went along with the group every single time. But do we know why they did it? Not really. Right? So there might have been conformity or there might have been compliance. And both can sometimes be good strategies. In a situation like this Sharif and Sharif experiment, where the real answer is really hard to get at, 
Um, and then we're measuring optical illusion. The objective reveal answer would have been zero. But you do see, you do believe that there is some kind of movement. So here, it just makes a lot of sense to develop conformity. Three, really hard to know the answer, so you want to learn from each other, you arrive at a common answer. So nothing wrong with conformity in such a situation. Clearly there is something wrong with conformity when it leads you to an obviously wrong answer. So that's not really what happened in our study. Participants who were interviewed afterwards said, of course I knew which line was right, but basically like Fuller said here, do as most do, everyone will, will be okay. So it was a case of compliance. And you can design studies in between those two, studies where it's a little bit hard to find the right answer. And you can show that more participants follow the group when the question is actually hard. So that would be a way to see whether there are different effects when the question is hard. You probably see more conformity when the question is very easy. You're left with compliance. When do we see conformity or compliance? A couple of conditions here, and I'll go through the evidence for the important ones. So unanimity is quite an essential condition. The upper line here is the original ASH study. And if you have a unanimous majority, actually rather few participants go along with it the first time. So the first time everyone gives the wrong answer, just 20% of participants go along with it. But then when you have the majority unanimously again and again give the wrong answer, a lot of participants end up sometimes going along. But if you have one single dissenter, it's a line at the bottom, the effect almost disappears. The first two times, effectively, no one goes along with the majority. The dissenter gives license to, ev to everyone to just follow their eyes, follow their own beliefs. And then later on, sometimes people go along with the majority, but the effect is very much diminished. As soon as a single person punctures the unanimity. So take away there is that there's big value in just speaking up when you think a group is going down the wrong path. Group size matters. Quite a fun study um, that they tried to see when group size would lead to compliance was conducted at a bus stop in Israel. And they realized that we needed six people to get a queue going. Obviously, one person isn't enough to start a queue. Two, probably still not very clear. So you need a couple more people to show that the thing to do, if you want to do what others do is to join the queue. In the specific context of the, of the line studies, Ash run them with different numbers of participants. And he found that actually three were enough. Three people all confidently giving the wrong answer were enough to get the, the participants to go along with them quite frequently. More didn't really have an effect. Later experiments suggested that there is some effect of having more participants, maybe up to seven, you get more compliance. So group size um, is another thing that, that contributes to conformity or compliance. And again, we usually don't know which of the two because that requires asking people about their motivations for their behavior. Status matters. 
if a group leader gets the wrong answer, it's more likely that people will accept it than if someone who's not in a leadership position. The more cohesive a group is, the more power it has. And partly that's just because a very cohesive group will at least create the impression that it really values cohesion. So if everyone always has the same opinion, the norm will be to share the opinion of the group leader or of the group majority rather. But minorities can change opinions. Evidently, since opinions change in groups, and they tend to still have a larger effect because of some shared bonds than people on the outside of the group would. So minority influence in groups is quite a big field of research. Public response would be expected to at least influence the level of compliance because compliance is all about public action. And there is some, actually quite a lot of evidence in favor of that. That if people write down in private, which line is the correct one, the, the compliance pressure isn't there. So they're less likely to give the wrong answer. However, this is one of the instances where a systematic meta-analysis of all studies failed to show that effect. And then, of course, when you really expect an effect with some, some good story for why the effect should be there, you realize that it's not actually there in the data we collected so far. It's an important point to kind of rethink your theory and think, for, for, think about alternative explanations. Prior commitments, on the other hand, definitely. Um, Reduce conformity. So I'm not likely to change my mind just because everyone in the group has given the wrong answer after me. Because there, then, cognitive dissonance and just the, the fear of losing face override the idea that it would be nice to, to go along. And of course, compliance can come from the payoff structure of a situation. When I'm in a room where I have no incentive to be right about the lines, but would quite enjoy being liked by my fellow students at the end of the experiment, it might be a completely rational thing to prioritize getting along with them over just giving the right answer in the situation where no one really benefits from hearing the right answer. If you change that structure, compliance drops dramatically. So this, this experiment by Baron and colleagues is quite a good one to tease conformity and compliance apart. So they gave participants two different tasks and two different levels of motivation. Motivation was just paying them for accuracy. In the low motivation task, they didn't get anything for being accurate. In the high motivation task, they were paid for accuracy. And then they gave them two different questions. One was very difficult. It wasn't obvious which answer was right. That's the green bars. When it was, um, when it was difficult and it didn't really matter whether they were right or wrong, about a third went along with the group, two thirds gave the response that they thought themselves was the right response. When they had an incentive to be right, we can see some clear evidence for conformity here, for social learning. The green line goes up dramatically because now they wanted to be right. They couldn't be sure in their own answer. So they learned from other people, quite a reasonable thing to do. 
for the easy task, where they could be sure of their own answer, the effect is in the exact opposite direction. So when there was no motivation to be right about a third complied with the group, likely because it's a nice thing to do, when they really wanted to be right, that dropped to about half, just about 15% now um, complied with the group. So this shows, I mean, for one, how we can tell conformity and compliance apart. And it shows that the motivation in the situation really matters. Which leads us back to some of the early discussions about the validity of lab experiments. So if I'm just not willing to spend any of my reputation on giving the right answer to some silly question about the length of lines, then maybe we shouldn't conclude from that, that we can easily be fooled into believing wrong things by a majority giving wrong answers. So this, these, these very controlled experiments like the line experiment can be quite difficult to interpret and to apply to more real world um, situations. And that's one of the tasks that's always left uh, to, to readers and users of research. So what about normative influence? Clearly, we want to be liked, especially by fellow members of groups that we care about. And conformity, to some degree, supports that. If you always disagree, always go against the group, or think of people who always do that, you can imagine that they are not particularly valued as group members. And then in such a situation, there will be some pressure, sometimes very explicit, sometimes less so, to get the deviant group members, the group members who have other opinions um, to join the majority. And if they never do, they might be excluded from the group. Um, there's some interesting research into uh, idiosyncrasy credits. So that some groups actually value some independence and that high status group members can sometimes be quite independent in their thinking without being penalized for it. But still, the general tendency is that groups like cohesion and especially group members expect that they will be liked better if they go along. An interesting question there is where the knowledge what the group wants can come from. And when it comes to issues around discrimination, around prejudice, we often see that everyone wants to go along with the group. But how do we know what a group does? Clearly, the group norm, whether you accept racist jokes, whether it's okay to bully your classmates, the group norm is never just the average of what people privately think because no one can access that. So everyone has to think about what the dominant position in the group is without having real, real access to that. And I would argue that it can quite easily be misunderstood that a couple of vocal people in a group who hold a certain opinion can be perceived as representing everyone. So this is one of the areas where in everyday life it's quite, quite important to sometimes reflect. Do we actually know what our peers want? Am I really the only one who feels uncomfortable right now? Or am I just one of the many who aren't really speaking out because 
we all think no one else feels uncomfortable. But also I think this is a, a rich field for research. Briefly returning to minority influence. So how can group members change or lead um, groups to change their opinion? Well, they cannot, they can do it if they're not alone. Generally, you need a minority group. And if they are consistent and united. So it's quite hard for, for a group to engage with conflicting minorities, then it's quite easy to just ignore them. But if there's one consistent minority, that minority can push for change. And interestingly, here we can again come back to the idea of public compliance as something that's not really about beliefs. And that majorities quite often sustain public compliance for much longer than conformity. So when, when you look at how some social changes came about, they might seem quite sudden. For example, looking at um, the rights for sexual minorities, you might have the feeling that homosexuals were discriminated against or excluded from public institutions for a very long time until suddenly marriage for all became a thing, adoption rights became a thing. But arguably it's just one of the, the examples for this effect here where a perceived majority ensured compliance for a long time while the minority consistently worked towards private acceptance, worked against conformity. So at some point, actually, a majority was in favor of things like marriage equality, leading to quite a quick switch in expressed opinions. So minority influence might just take a long time to become visible and still be effective all along. But to wrap up, just a quick run through the main ideas from today. The first question was, do we work better and harder in the presence of others? And there, one concept was social facilitation. It says that the dominant response, the default response becomes more likely when others are there, which makes us perform better on easy tasks, worse on difficult tasks. Social loafing was the next big, big concept, which just describes the typical tendency to work less hard in the presence of others than we would do on our own. Deindividuation came next, and it's the concept that explains mob mentality, that explains how group members might give up control and just follow the group norms, supported by being an anonymous part of a large group. Then we talked about opinion formation in group contexts and said that groups tend to develop more coherent and committed and unfortunately also polarized um, opinions over time which might explain all kinds of social dynamics. And then in thinking about how groups shape individual beliefs, the key takeaway would be to distinguish informational and normative influences. So I might just legitimately, or also not legitimately, but I might believe that I get new information from other group members and then adopt their beliefs in their way of acting in terms of conformity. Or am I plainly want to do as others do, basically just engage in surface acting, which is what compliance is. And a combination 
of all these aspects. Group members complying with group norms, only looking out for information that supports the trajectory they are on, often leads to groups making bad decisions. And there's a really important role that can be played by uh, minority members, by people who happen to be in the minority in a group on a particular issue, if they consistently speak up um, and engage in that role. Again, quite a lot of material for, for you to take in. So please take a moment to note down any questions you have. And then I'll see you in the live sessions.